All right. Um, so script tag, what is the script tag and why do we need it? One of you knows. Mm -hmm. um, so script tag lets us write JavaScript in our HTML. Um, if I try to just do like five plus six, it doesn't actually do five plus six, it just outputs the text five plus six. Um, so to actually tell HTML JavaScript needs to execute, we write it in the script tag and nothing actually gets output. Um, since the script tag doesn't have any visual output, unless we do something like console log. And in this, uh, the console tab is actually the, the console log. Um, and the output is the HTML. So the output is gonna be anything that we might write with like H1. So that's just the uh, the output we're working with here. Uh, oh, um, yeah. So I think the correct way is, or it used to be, you have to say like type equals JavaScript or text slash JavaScript, but with the HTML5 standard, I believe script always defaults to JavaScript, and you only need to specify something if you're doing a different language. Yeah, oh no, um, great question. They always pertain to the same browser window. And this is the same with CSS. So CSS and script tags. So we're going to see, uh, or we're going to use things like the style tag. And we can put them in the head, or we could put them in the body. They both, both script and style, since they don't have a visual representation, it doesn't really matter where you put them. Um, the difference of putting them in the head versus putting them in the body is mainly when the code gets run. So browsers, and this is actually a source of a lot of errors for newcomers to JavaScript in D3. The browser runs your code in the order you write it. Um, and this is important in D3 because if we have HTML below a script tag with actual D3 code, the HTML isn't going to exist on the page when the D3 code runs. Um, so usually we're, we're going to um, follow this practice where we write all of our code in a single function. And then once the page loads, we just run all of the code. Um, so that's the main thing you have to worry about with where you put the tag is just does the code that's running in this tag depend on other things elsewhere on the page. All right, so um, I'm gonna just create a few elements here. Uh, so H1, let's just say title, uh, to just play around with, with the D3. Uh, paragraph. All right, has anyone here used um, something like? So console.log is the internal browser's like terminal and document.write actually writes to the visible web page. So if I do, um, document dot write.
So document.write hello world is going to write to the web page and not the console, but console.log actually writes to Yeah, so console.log writes to the console, which is only visible if someone else is viewing your page from like the inspector. So only people who open the inspector see console log. Um, document.write is just a way to use JavaScript to write HTML. Uh, so I can actually in here write things like H2 tags. So if I want to write to the page, um, Notice document that write. Uh, I'm going to close the console here just so there's more room. Uh, so document that write. I'm actually writing an HTML tag, but the tag isn't showing up on the page as just raw text. It actually, when you use document that write, tells the page to process it as it would any other HTML. I yeah, so it's inside body, and I think it appends it at the end. Um, I actually never use it uh, in practice, and I think it appends it to the end. But since this page has this like really active live refresh, it might do different things than if you actually wrote it in your code. But usually, it's only used for debugging. Like you never want to necessarily put document right in your code, unless you're either procedurally generating some visualization, which we'll use D3 for, or unless you're debugging. But most people debug with uh, console.log. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with um, you can do it with CSS or actually with D3. Um, is there a particular way you want to change the styles? Mm -hmm. um, in in this like separation of separation of concerns of technologies, usually all of style I I do with CSS, um, and CSS is also a declarative type of language. Um, and in here, if we want to change h1, we're going to write h1 uh, selector. And in here, we're going to write color, uh, let's say red. And have you guys in the, I guess, other classes done CSS selectors when you did like web scraping or anything? All right, so just another refresher. Um, I think I briefly mentioned this last time when we did HTML, um, but there's two types of um, attributes that we can put on elements. We can put an ID, in this case, I'm unique, and we can put a class, in this case, uh, let's just say class bold. And the way to also, to make this interesting, let's say paragraph. And also, All right, so here we have three paragraphs, one with an ID and a class, another with a class down here, and then one with neither. And CSS selectors are the main way that we're going to use D3 um, to figure out which elements we actually want to draw into. And the syntax for CSS selectors is um, a dot for classes. 
So in this case, period bold signals to select or find all of the elements on the page that have class bold. And in this case, we can change this property called font weight. Uh, and again, this is something, um, usually you can just look up these, these properties. Font weight goes from, I think, like 100 to 800. Um, 800 being bold, 100 being not bold. And I think you can also do things like just straight bold. Yeah, so you can say font weight bold. Um, the body text, or this is the body text and make me bold have both been bold. Um, in case that's hard to see, let's also change the color to be yellow. Oh, and And then to select an identifier, we use the hash. So in this case, if we want to select that I'm unique, and in this case, change the background color to orange. So now we have bold, which makes all of its elements bold and blue. We have I'm unique, which makes all of its background color orange. And we can see here in this is the body text. We have it both bold and unique. In make me bold, we only have the bold styles applied. And then in the second paragraph, we just have nothing applied. So these CSS styles are going to be additive and um, what I just walked through here, this is the hand-coded way to do this, but I'm sure all of you can imagine this isn't going to be efficient or easy when we have thousands of data points. Question. Yeah, so in terms of what you can do, most things you can do with one or the other, you can do with both, but the correct semantic difference is that IDs should only be applied to one element and classes are applied to multiple. So while it would work in the browser to attach an ID to two elements, it's not the correct way because if I'm a programmer and I see that you have an ID, I use the fact that I know ID should be unique in some of the code I write. Um, so it's not necessarily what you can or can't do, but it's how, what they represent more. Um, it doesn't. Um, yeah, so the style is actually probably the most flexible of tags in terms of placement. Um, yeah, you can pretty much put it anywhere. The convention usually is to put it in the head just so it is out of the way of the elements that actually have a visual representation. So if you want to like clearly separate, these are the things that visually show up on the page and these are the things that are like metadata. Um, that's why we, we might want to put it in the head instead. All right, so this was a little bit of a recap of what we did last lab. And now we are, uh, oh, the snapshot. Um, now I want to go through and do the same things with D3 as, as an example, um, and get into a little bit of, of um, hopefully the, the power of D3. So the three things that we actually did when we hand coded this, uh, there are, I guess, the, I call them the three components of D3. I don't know what other people call them, but uh, so 
So D3 is this library that's very, I would say, composable. Once you understand the three components, you can arrange the three components in a plethora of different ways to get a variety of different graphics. And the three components that we often deal with are things called uh, selector functions. What I call mutators. And the last thing is uh, accessory. So we saw selectors in hand-coded CSS. Selectors are basically ways to selectively apply certain styles or code to certain elements without affecting others. In D3, um, we can do that with this function called select all. And the select functions for the sake of being really consistent with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript conventions, just use CSS selectors. Quick question, um, has anyone used jQuery in here? All right, so for folks who've used jQuery, jQuery is um, probably the most commonly used JavaScript library, and it follows the same convention of how to manipulate elements on the web page. And this should also feel kind of similar to what you might have done with web scraping and, and web parsing. If you've done it, you download a bunch of HTML and you might selectively want to say, pull out the title of every article on the page with Python or R. Um, in this case, we're doing a similar procedure and saying, I know I want to apply a style to all of the elements tagged bold. Um, so in, again, the declarative nature, it even starts to sound like SQL. So d3.select, um, what are we selecting? Selecting elements where class equals bold. And what do we want to do to these? Um, well, let's actually change the text to be um, Let's say we're like a hacker, we've written some code, and now we've changed the text of all the bold elements to actually say, I'm in your site. Um, again, this feels very different from the JavaScript we wrote last week. We don't have any for loops, we don't have any variables, we don't have var i, we don't have iterate through um, all of the elements. And Instead, we have this chainable syntax, which again um, is declarative in the sense that it automatically applies what comes after in the chain to everything that came before. Um, and internally, you can think of it as doing this looping. So it says, every element that gets returned by select all, run function text on all of those. Uh, and text in this case is our first mutator that we've seen. The selector is going to be So we have dot select, which actually figures out which things we want to mutate. We have dot text, which is what I'm going to call a mutator. And then we'll see in, in um, a little bit what these accessors actually are. Um, questions on this single line of code about what's going on here? Cool. Um, is there anything that someone in the uh, the audience <laughs> wants to change about this page and see how to do it in D3. 
what what's the next manipulation we should make to this page? Yeah, yeah, so I'll show the first uh, the first aspect of the question. So again, the question was, what if we want to take in the text instead of change the text? And in this case, the thing to note about all of the mutator functions is that if you don't give them an argument, they return whatever that element actually is. So if we say select all bold dot text and we don't give dot text an argument, it says you must want to read what the text is rather than write new text. And in this, if we console log paragraph text, You can see here that it's logged. Um, this is the body text. And let's see. Yeah, so it it's only seems to be printing out a single um, body text, not all of the bodies. Um, some functions actually return like entire arrays of all of the elements if you've selected multiple. Um, some return the first. Uh, in this case, if we move make me bold to the top, make me bold is what, what gets printed out. So usually for these things, I would say test out um, what they actually return in the console because they can give potentially unexpected results. Um, but we'll see how we're going to use this um, mutator function without an argument to then manipulate things later. And in this case, if we want to actually just change the text to have something else in it, uh, We can actually just do a plus with a string. Um, other uh, other things that people might want to just change with this page. Yes, um, slightly more cumbersome than other things in in D three. Um, but let's let's do it. Uh, so I'm gonna get rid of this to actually change the position of text. Where, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to only select one of these bold elements. Actually, we'll select the ID to show. So this is an example of when an ID is. When it's more important that IDs are only on one element, because um, again, if I'm a programmer, I may not have actually coded up this page myself. 
But if I am looking at the HTML, I might see there's this I'm unique ID. And I'm going to use the fact that I am assuming that there's only one element to use dot select instead of dot select all. Um, the difference of select and select all is that select gets a single element, whereas select all gives you an array of elements. Um, so we're selecting one. And to actually change the position on the page, in this case, uh, Don't know if paragraphs can do that. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't ever really change the position of text, but to show a, a similar uh, in the spirit of that, let's actually change the margin. Um, so the margin is going to move the uh, the element around. Or it should. Uh, All right, uh, fun fact. Um, when you pass these arguments to change styles, it expects them as strings. Um, but explaining what's happening here. So dot style is going to be our second um, mutator that we're going to encounter. It's probably going to be the one that we use the most. So even though dot text is useful for labels and annotation, um, dot style is going to be much more useful when you start drawing circles and want to change the colors. And in this case, um, dot style actually takes two arguments. The first argument is the CSS style that you either want to read or write. So in this case, if we just type dot style with an argument of margin, or let's say uh, margin top, it will return what the margin currently is. And if we want to set a new margin, we pass in a second argument. In this case, we're going to say margin top, let's do something uh, like 200 pixels. So the first argument is what we're trying to uh, read or write. And then if there's a second argument, it changes that, that property value. And we can see here on the side, that there's this large space on top of, um, this is the body text, which is the single element on the page that has ID um, here. Um, questions about this part? So D3 seems like it's this great thing that helps us write paragraphs better and color them better. Um, but D3 can do so much more. Uh, and we haven't actually touched these things called accessors. Um, so I'm going to actually save this if no one has any other questions on it, and then just open up a new bin and actually create some charts and plots. Uh, any last questions on this HTML here? Mm -hmm. So in JSON, it actually doesn't have a tab. Um, let me go to this other tool here. Uh, just quickly, I want to test something.
So a lot of the the tools don't have like an autocomplete, but I think the Chrome console actually does. Uh, other fun fact. Um, so if you ever want to do D3 on any any web page that doesn't have D3 on it, um, all you need to do is you go to the D3 GitHub, you go here, and this is actually the source of the D3 library. Um, one of the just like awkward things of JavaScript libraries is that since they're all just running in the browser, most of them are just these single functions. So this is a single function that's like 10,000 lines of JavaScript. Um, and JavaScript doesn't really have a super good like package manager. You can't just like import D3. Um, but what you can do is you can just copy and paste the entire library as text. Um, so that's all of D3. You can send it to your friends. You can have them code things in the browser. And now we have D3. Woo! Um, so if you ever want to like play around with the New York Times, just open up the console and put D3 in there, and you can play around with the articles. Uh, But the reason I want to do that here is to actually see if there is, uh, ah, so Chrome has this like crazy functionality in its console. I didn't even realize it does this, but it actually is showing me the history of all of the select alls that I've ever run. Um, so I once changed all of the paragraph summaries on the New York Times to cat burrito. Um, a while ago, and it remembers that. I've also changed an image source. Um, so I had no idea it actually does that, which is kind of weird and bizarre. Um, but uh, Chrome console actually has aggressive autocomplete. Um, so if we want to select all paragraphs, and then let's say change the style, uh, oh, it only does it if you've entered it before. Uh, so for style properties, it doesn't do autocomplete, but for other functions, it does. Uh, so just like in IPython, if we save all of our paragraphs, to a function or a, a variable, the Chrome console now knows that variable paras is actually a D3 object. So when we type dot, it tells us all the functions we can run on it. So we can see here we can run append, we can run dot attr, whatever that does, we can do fill, whatever that does. So we haven't talked about any of these, um, but we can, oh, uh, uh, we can do dot style. I don't know how that zoom did. Mac always. Um, so if you are playing around, um, with D3 on a page, and you're not sure what types of objects you have, you can just save them to a variable and do dot, and then um, look at what you can run on it. Um, in terms of a CSS uh, reference, I usually just search for like CSS cheat sheet, and tons of people just make these. Um, So here is like a really nice one, um, and it tells you 
about selectors. It tells you all about what you can do to text. It tells you all about what you can do with positioning. It tells you all about what you can do with um, colors. And usually, if, if you can do it in a word processor, you can do it on the web. And most of the things are called the same. So if you do want to change like margins, I always just search for CSS margins or something, whatever I want to change, I just Google search for it. Um, a little plug, um, don't use W3 schools ever. Um, so W3 schools is in this weird position where it somehow has like always the top answer on Google search results. Um, some of the stuff is actually like not totally right on there. There's like some wrong things, some syntax issues. Um, but the second result is always Mozilla usually. So skip past W3 schools, go to the Mozilla developer network. Um, and if you want to just search for something on Mozilla directly, you can always prepend things and say CSS margin. Um, if you do MDN, it always brings you Mozilla's page. Um, so again, this is like the docs for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. There isn't like an official, here's the JavaScript documentation since every browser maker has their own implementation. But this is Mozilla's documentation of how it's implemented JavaScript and CSS. So in here, we can see the margin CSS property has all of these things. We can start it with these values. And we can also do things with um, top, bottom, left, and right. So that's my advice for figuring out what styles and CSS you can do in the most quick, correct way possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it is on if it is on a page, the nice thing about JavaScript is that um, most of all the libraries are just all in the global scope. So here, this is a page that seems to have D3. It has this interactive plot. So if we go into the console, and we type D3, it, it shows up there. Um, but if it doesn't, you can copy and paste. 